Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Virtual Women and Children First. My name is Sarah Hollenbeck, and I'm the co-owner of Women and Children First, one of the last feminist bookstores in the United States. We are so excited for tonight's event with Riva Lair in celebration of the Riva's memoir, Poem Girl, which published today, right? This is the book birthday, um, this beautiful book um, that we're so excited to celebrate tonight. Riva will be joined in conversation with Audrey Nithenaker. We begin our virtual events as we begin our events held in the school with a land acknowledgement. Um, just one moment, I'm hearing a little bit of uh, echo, so I'm going to look into that. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I think it stopped. I'm not sure what that was. <gasps> okay. So please join me in acknowledging that the land on which the bookstore stands is the occupied unceded territory of the Peoria, the Potawatomi, the Miami, and the Sioux people. We encourage all of you to learn more about land acknowledgements and the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event. Thank you so much. Um, tonight, we are also joined by our ASL interpreter, Heidi Ledwin, and our captioner, Sally Bennett. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Be sure to drop all of your questions for the authors in the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Also, I'll be dropping a link to buy the book um, in the chat bar. Uh, on the on the side of your screen, but Gollum Girl is our most pre-ordered book of 2020. So I think a lot of you watching have already purchased the book. So thank you so much. Okay, on to the event. Riva Lair is an artist, writer, and curator whose work focuses on issues of physical identity and socially challenged bodies. She is best known for representations of people with impairments and those whose sexuality or gender identity have long been stigmatized. A longtime faculty member at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Riva Lair is currently an instructor in medical humanities at Northwestern University. Audrey Nithenager is a visual artist and author, in addition to the best-selling novels, The Time Traveler's Life and Her Fearful Symmetry, she is the author of four illustrated novels, The Three Ancestral Sisters, The Adventurous, Raven Girl, and The Night Book Mobile, which I love. And she is the editor of Ghostly. She also collaborated with Eddie Campbell on the graphic story collection, Bizarre Romance. She currently lives in Chicago. Well, y'all, it's been a heck of a year. <laughs> we originally imagined that this very launch party was going to be held at a venue, uh, not at the bookstore, and a venue that hit a, um, that could accommodate 150 people. But then COVID hit, and we re-envisioned all of our as gathering outside in tents and having a big book like wedding. <laughs> and now we're here um, in this digital Zoom room. And I am so deeply grateful to be here. I am grateful to be anywhere honoring this incredible book. It is a triumph. Gollum Girl is a triumph. It is not a book about overcoming. And it's not one of those crypts, they're just like us, a story of normalizing the non-normative. This is a disability narrative that embraces the darkness and the humor and the messiness and the monster. I needed this book, the world needed this book, and the world needs Riva. So please, before I get too emotional, um, join me in welcoming Riva Lair and Audrey Nithenaker. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, 
I am so excited to be able to congratulate you, Riva, on your book's birthday. Um, there's something really magical about a pub day, and it's even more so for a first book. And this book is not just uh, new and wonderful, but it's also a memoir and it's also a compendium of so much of your art. And it just seems to bring together so many things that you've been thinking about for so many years, things you and I have been talking about for the several decades that we've known each other. And I guess I would just like to start by, uh, by saying that if we were together in a room with all these people who are here virtually with us, I think there would be a standing ovation because uh, this book is such an achievement. And, uh, and I, I'm just so happy for you. Um, perhaps for starters, um, if you could just talk a little bit about what what is this book? Um, because it's kind of a hybrid of many things. It is. Um, it's, I would say, three or four books in one. Um, one is the story of how I grew up, um, which I felt was important if I was going to talk about my involvement in disability culture, which was the first purpose of the book. Um, it was really important to explain how I got there. And also while I was, it, it actually started as a document for my family that I wanted them to have something that would explain my work after I wasn't around anymore. And as I started to do that, it started to be um, important to look back and start doing research about um, what the truth was about the past, things I didn't know. And as I started to find things out, particularly about my mother, <clears throat> that completely astonished me. Um, that part of the book really grew and changed my understanding of a lot of my life. And then once I got to my original goal, which was to explain my work, it got very obvious that in talking about my work, because what I do for anyone who doesn't know, the three people out there who aren't my cousins, um, that um, I interview people about their lives, people who experience stigma. And I get these incredible stories in the studio that are just, um, I'm so incredibly privileged to be let into the com complexities, real complexities of people's lives. And when I heard these stories, they hooked themselves into my life. And so the next part of it really became understanding myself through other people. Um, so that's the kind of narrative part of the book, but also because it was about that, um, One World, my publisher was fabulous in agreeing to put color all the way through the book. So the book does function almost as a catalog resume of my work and does go into depth in the back um, with specific stories about a lot of people who work with me. So that's the kind of complicated amalgam that this thing is. Here, look, it's been stripped of its cover, naked gone. So, so that's as, as clear an explanation as I can give. Um, one of the things that struck me reading this was that uh, over the years, you've told me a lot of these stories and I've watched you make a lot of this art. And something that kind of amazed me really was how, because, because we're friends and because you tell me the stories because something in day-to-day -day conversation has brought something to your mind and you tell it to me and I file it away with all the other stories you've told me. But reading this book, um, there was almost a kind of a, a telescoping or an unfolding where for the first time I really saw how your life 
connected up, how things in your childhood manifest in the art that you're making now and you know stories that I've heard about family members of yours who I've never met echo themselves in the kind of portraiture that you do and so it all it seemed like a, a project of I don't know it's it struck me as a project where you make yourself whole in a way yes. and exactly. there's an old image of yours which it put me to mind of which was called in the yellow woods which i don't think is in the book it is it is, is it okay somewhere yeah yeah and and in that um you're you're out in these woods and you're you're fashioning a new skeleton and it struck me that you had created a new skeleton in this book that it it I guess what I'm asking as a question is do you feel like writing this book has changed very much how you how you see the things that you wrote about in other words have you it it you know you people think of of the past as the ingredients for memoir but it seems also as though the writing changes you, changes the writer? Um, I really understood. I mean, one of the reasons I used the metaphor of the golem in the book is because the golem is a construction of others. And that is so immensely true of me. And I don't just mean medically. I really deeply know that I am a product of the relationships that I been in for, for good and for bad, but that I wanted to really look at how I had survived, um, again, not medically, as much as becoming a functional person in a world that told me I wasn't going to be. And that, you know, starting from childhood and the astonishing coincidence of who my mother was, and I'll leave that to readers to find out. Um, and then moving through this series of people that just opened doors and opened doors and opened doors. And a lot of them were, as I got to step into the lives of their bodies, I found each time a new way to stay in mine and to understand mine. And then what that really means is how are you going to act in the world? Not, you know, what do you see in the mirror as much as who can you be when you walk out the door? And so the book for me really is um, this journey through incredibly transformational relationships, only you know a handful of which I got to focus on. But I think that are, there are a lot of people out there listening tonight who know that they are among the people who really, and you are, you are top of the pops kid. Oh. There would be no book. There'd be, I would be a different person a much lesser person if we had never met. So, you know, um, I would love it if when people read the book, if it gives them um, the impetus to go through their own lives and start seeing um, who stepped in when it was just so urgent that that person be there at that moment. And again, I don't mean rescue. I don't mean coming to help. I mean that we open doors for each other. We give each other permission and new views of how to be. And when we're lucky, we meet people who just make that such a kaleidoscope, such an incredible prism of possibility. And, you know, that's what I'm trying to explain. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe now is a good time for you to read the uh, selection from the book. So, audience. First off, the reading glasses. Second, we had a little bit of a computer adventure today. So I am going to be doing what is excitingly called real-time editing. So I will try and keep this um, in the time allotted. So forgive me if it gets a little messy. All right. <clears throat> First, hot liquids, which I have not spilled on my lap. Yummy. And 
I chose this because it's an adventure that Audrey and I had a number of years ago. The chapter is called Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And by the way, each chapter title is a horror movie or a horror novel. Philadelphia, November 2006. November on the East Coast was autumn in its original factory settings. The air was sharp and clear as beveled glass, the sky a glaze of luminous blue. Audrey and I made our way along the tilting sidewalks of Philadelphia, where buildings warped and sagged as if begging to lie down after centuries of upright behavior. After an hour of touristy lostness, we fetched up in front of a somber hulk of Georgian brick. Pardon me, my voice is <clears throat> decided it could be interesting tonight. Audrey jogged my arm. There, concealed among the welter of pilasters, scrollwork, scroll work, and dentate cornice, was a square bronze sign, the Mutter Museum. We traded wicked grins. Here we go. The Mutter's white, um, okay, I'm gonna skip that a little bit. The Mutter Museum began as the private collection of Dr. Thomas Dent Mutter. In 1858, Dr. Mutter donated it to the Philadelphia College of Surgeons to be used as a teaching tool for the medical school. <clears throat> the collection remained private for decades, but in the 1970s, the museum was open to the public and now claimed to host over 130,000 visitors a year. The website tantalized with images of its famous exhibits, including the plaster death cast a Chang and Ang bunker the original Siamese twins, the skeletons of Harry Eastlack and of the so-called Kentucky giant, and the megacolon, a body part that seemed to have escaped from the Marianas Trench. Some exhibits featured normative bodies, but the focus of the collection was on disabilities, primarily those, resu <clears throat> those resulting from injury, disease, and birth anomaly. I was there in my guise as an anatomy instructor. Audrey was doing research for a book. Neither of us was motivated by the Mutter's reputation as one of the 10 creepiest museums in the world. Of course not. The Mutter couldn't decide whether to be a teaching museum or Roger Corman's House of Horrors. The ambience encouraged, encouraged desire for the outre while reassuring the viewers that such desires were respectable by making feints towards education. These attempts were unserious in the extreme. The labels were so old and spidery as to be indecipherable, and a general air of boogity boo pervaded what information there was. It came as no surprise that the Mutter's big yearly event was an all night sleepover on All Hallows Eve. Pardon me. <coughs> no more dairy in this lifetime ever. The upper floor of the Mutter Museum was dominated by the Hurdle Skull Collection, 139 skulls that lined one entire wall. I couldn't help showing off. See that lump sticking out of his jaw? The mandible was broken at some point and healed badly. And those thin zygomatic arches, bad nutrition. And that skull is female. Men have a heavier brow ridge. Audrey raised an eyebrow pedantic much. Where upstairs was a dry boneyard, the low, lower level was replete with wet items and jars. The air reeked of chemicals. Audrey turned a whiter shade of pale, of puke, sorry. A large specimen vitrine had cracked down one side. We suspected that the mutter was trying to stealth embalm a visitor or two. We stood in front of the skeleton of Harry Eastlack whose fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva had caused webs and streamers and sheets of calcium to form inside his body, as if Eastlack was growing a suit of armor from the inside out. Audrey pondered, how does something like that even happen? It's like he was attacked by malevolent spiders. Not sure, some immune system thing? Maybe his bones kept thinking they were broken and never stopped trying to repair themselves, like a car alarm that won't turn off. She said, sometimes I wish I didn't know about these things. Now I'll probably have nightmares about ossification. That looks 
extremely uncomfortable. I snorted. 10 bucks says Harry is going to show up in your next aquatint. On one hand, the mutter was a matchless compendium of human variation, a primer on the intersection of nature and chance, on biology as half order, half chaos. But too many exhibits stank of the sideshow. One floor to ceiling case held the skeleton of the so-called Kentucky giant. It stood between an unidentified male skeleton of normal height and the little person skeleton of Mary Ashbery. This was no benign comment on human morphology. The average male skeleton was only there to emphasize the abnormality of the other two. Most gallingly, the skull of Mary's stillborn infant, Mary had died in childbirth, had been plopped on the floor at her feet. When disabled bodies are displayed in public, they usually fulfill one of two purposes. Some, such as the mutter's head of a woman with a cutaneous horn, illustrate a condition that medicine claims to have cured out of existence. Other bodies, like Chang and Ang, represent conditions that medicine promises to erase, eradicate. We're assured that such impairments will be left in the past or gone in the imminent future. The mutter specimens exist in a split timeline, a tempest bifida, tempest bifida that flows around us on either side, leaving us, the viewers, untouched in the present moment. A school group poured into the museum with their shrieks and giggles of, no way, is that real and gross? They stared at me as if I were an exhibit come to life. I'd lost Audrey somewhere in the maze of cases. cases. As I wandered off in search of her, I passed a sizable cabinet in the middle of the room. Its shelves were laden with jars of preserved fetuses and stillborn infants. I stopped. I'd never really looked at such specimens. These seem to have either significantly more or rather less than the regulation number of parts. Their labels were redolent of Greek mythology, phocomelia, sirenomelia, and encephaly, gastrochesis. I saw multiple pairs of conjoined twins merged at the head or the heart or the spine. All specimens had long, long ago lost their baby pink coloration and had bleached to an aqueous ivory. I concentrated on what embryology I could remember and thought I was being wonderfully objective, which stopped as soon as I reached the middle of the case. I was standing in front of my own body. To be exact, bodies. Two entire shelves of jars dedicated to spina bifida. One fetus had my precise version, spina bifida lipomyelomeningeum. There I was, the infant who had emerged from my mother's body. This infant, this astonishment, this red birthday balloon, this me in taxidermy, this me. The specimens were much older than I was. Immersion had swollen their bodies until they'd become too big for their containers, inmates pushing against the bars of their cells. Their faces were turned to the wall, but even so, their eyes pulled me straight through the glass. I, the anatomy professor, had never gone looking for photos of spina bifida. Deep down, I'd not wanted to know. I leaned my forehead against the case. Audrey found me and wrapped her hand around my arm, worried that I might faint. A century had passed since the mutter female fetuses were preserved, yet they still floated inside their round glass houses, naked and ancient as cave fish, their only biographies, the medical details of their anomalies. Where had they come from? Why was the mutter their resting place? Of this, nothing was said. The fetuses were perfectly ahistorical bodies. Like the jar, jar children, my body was a marker in time. In a way, I too had no history no spina bifida elders to show me how to age. The jar babies were my ancestors. And yet, and yet, 
the jar of children relieved me of a loneliness that I had never, that I never, pardon me. And yet, and yet, the jar of children relieved me of a loneliness that I never even knew I had. They brought me to a place past words, past analysis or politics or even beauty. I longed to slip a jar of siblings into my purse. I leaned my palms against the chilly glass and wished for the 10,000th time that I could ask my mother anything at all. Thank you. That's that beautiful. is parts of that chapter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that comes, I think, about two thirds into the book. Almost three quarters, I think, yeah. Yeah, and so by that time, of course, the reader has met your mother and knows a lot about your childhood and you know we've been to art school with you and watched you coming along as an artist and so there's there's quite a bit of uh context that the reader has in that scene and yet uh hearing it as a standalone piece it really uh it really hit me you know the the kind of uh timelessness, um, the feeling of being a body in a long history of bodies and connected to other bodies. And um, I mean, that's another thing that struck me about this book, you know, the one of the delights for me was hearing about um, the school that you went to when you were a kid and how, how extraordinary it was and how much you loved it and all the things that happened. And so um, I was wondering if you could talk to, talk for just a minute or two about why the time and place of your childhood um, meant that things were a little different for you than they might've been if you'd been born uh, much earlier. Well, if I'd been born earlier, I wouldn't be alive because they only invented the surgery to close the spina bifida lesion within a few years before I was born. Before that, doctors were told to wait until children were two years old, and if they lived, then go ahead and treat them. But because what spina bifida often does is leave a literal hole in the back, everything can just go straight up the spinal cord into the brain. And so it was 95% fatal before the invention of that surgery. And then the other thing was that um, at the time, almost all schools were residential and um, uh, vocational, which is <laughs> really just meant that people were trained to like stuff boxes and you know maybe work, I don't know, cash registers was sort of the top tiers, my, my um, impression, but mostly sheltered workshops and very, very minor um, employment, if at all. A lot of people never left the, you know, went straight from the hospital into, into an institution, never came out again. And that was still very much going on when I was born. However, Cincinnati, which has had its progressive periods, and Cincinnati, come on, get your act together. It used to be morning. Anyway. Um, uh, founded this school called Condon, where the idea was that you would give disabled children a more or less standard academic education. And this was considered just absolutely revolutionary. I've read hundreds of articles now about it and what a breakthrough this was and national press. And so <clears throat> it was founded 60 years before I went there. Um, I think it's 60 years. And the thing was that Condon, um, it was originally built for kids with orthopedic impairments, but by the time I went there, it had a variety of different kinds of impairments. And I got to know and be friends with kids with a wide range of experiential morphological variants. And it was an early introduction to what disability community could be and also a safe space where we could just be children instead of what we were, so many of us were, 
as soon as we left, which was the neighborhood weirdo, freak, pariah, kid left out, whatever. Um, we had a place where eight hours a day we were children having friends and hobbies and classes and plays and that didn't exist el almost anywhere else. So I really feel that, and there's so much more, but that school for me was the seed of the work that I've gone on to do because I don't know that I would have recognized the beauty of community and just the, oh God, the first time I ever went to the Society for Disability Conference and I'm walking around the hotel and people with all kinds of disabilities are just, you know, hundreds of people. And I just kept thinking, oh my God, it's Condon School. Oh my God, we all grew up and, we, and we're in this huge reunion. And I just, I was sort of staggering around. I'm like staggered. And, you know, and for anybody who has read that, those chapters, this is the pendant that I talk about. So you get to see it in real life and you'll know what I mean when you get there. So does that kind of. Yeah, that's, that's enough to get started on. Um, as long as I've known you, you've been a figurative artist and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about being a figurative artist. Um, you know, the, the time period when you went to art school was not the friendliest for figurative art. And so I've always been interested in your artistic direction and how you chose to do that and how your interest in bodies and, and humans has translated into the kind of art that you do. Well, first off, you know, like I said, I, I grew up aware that there was a variety of bodies, but I also grew up in a medical family, um, a family that was very interested in what happened to the body and understanding it and exploring it and talking about it. Um, and as I say in the book, I also grew up in the hospital and in the hospital, um, I mean, I spent huge chunks of my childhood in the hospital and you don't have the outdoors, you don't have animals, you don't have the weather, you don't have travel, you don't have shops, you don't, you know, well, there's the gift shop, which think, please let me go down to the gift shop, I'll be good. Um, but all there is is people and people are in charge of your life. And so it behooves you for every reason to be very aware of how people communicate, how they feel about themselves, how they feel about you. Um, I think I just became hypersensitive sensitive to people early on. And I've tried to do other, I've done a lot of animal work. Um, animals are also very engaging for me, but that's been kind of a side project. Um, there are animals in my work, but, uh, but people, um, they're just kind of big chunks of poetry to me. And when you are in the studio and you're looking really deeply at what someone looks like and trying to understand the structure and trying to get them right. And then also you're telling stories and the stories are like, mm, like weaving themselves through their skin somehow, like the story and the person and the bones and the skin and the hair and the lighting and the costumes. and it all just fuses and becomes this incredible experience. I, at the same time, my work is in many ways political, um, not obviously so. I don't do agitprop or I try not to, but it's political in the sense that, you know, we're still in a culture that has such rigid standards of what beauty is and what's acceptable. And every single one of us is under pressure to be something else. That's what our economy is founded on, is the pressure to be someone else. And, or to want something, a specific someone. That's the, the flavor of the day. And so we're all being kind of knocked sideways out of our bodies by everything around us. We're not 
celebrated for who we are. We're told we're, you know, go buy this other thing and you'll look like, anyway, I don't need to explain that. You guys know what I'm talking about. So what I realized is that bodies that are different for me, um, whether they're queer or disabled or trans or people of color or just a wide range, people who are different in, in the context in which they're told they're different um, become extremely aware of themselves, of how they're being looked at, how they're living in their bodies, what their bodies need, when they feel safe, when they feel beautiful, um, when they can let down their guards, what their armor looks like. There's a way that I don't see that in people who from the outside, as far as I can see, have absolutely standard normal bodies. I don't see that kind of intensity um, of occupation of the body. And for me, that's the beauty that I see. It's not about prettiness at all. It's about this self-knowledge that I really want to, that's what I'm looking at when I'm working with someone in the studio. And being figurative is so much more about um, this than I think this kind of art is better than another kind of art. It's not. I love a lot of different kinds of art, but this is where I find my meaning. One of the things that has interested me in hearing you talk about the process of writing your book while you've been working on it. You've been very patient. <laughs> We've You're had a lot of patient. phone conversations about this book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's been a delight because um, in your artwork, I feel as though some of part of your project is using the human gaze as a tool for healing. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing, of course, there's nothing to look at. And so it seems as though by writing the book, you took that healing gaze and brought it inward so that it's almost like a, a thing that, that gets inside your head. And, and it's almost as though you're now looking inside of your own being and allowing us to inhabit along with you, your experiences. And so something that I've wanted to ask is, does the completed book um, feel to you very much like your self-portraits feel to you? Yes, I mean, one would hope that a memoir would do that. And, you know, the memoirs I love have that, exactly that aspect. I'm glad to hear that you saw that in my book because all the memoirs that mean a lot to me sound exactly the way that you've described. Um, the difference is that the other reason I started writing, even before the book, is that the thing that bugs me often about my work is that as I'm taking the stories, sometimes the details overwhelm the image a little too much, trying to get all of the, as they say, attributes of the subject into the piece. And so I really wanted to lift away some of the words out of the portraits, at least insofar as things I needed to say about being disabled or being different or being queer or whatever it was, I needed a place to put my words so that the images could be a little bit more formally, um, breathe a little more. And mm -hmm. I can see that more in my self-portraits because I don't feel like I have to explain. I can just kind of explore whatever is, seems urgent or formally important. Often I'll experiment more in my work, my self-portraits than I do in, <clears throat> in the subject work because I feel such responsibility. I mean, that's getting back to figure painting or figure work. You'll notice that my work isn't very formally adventurous. Um, it's pretty much more or less within the bounds of realism. I'm not a, a great realist, but it's, 
you know, it's perceptual um, work because the painters I love who are formally brilliant, what I feel like is that what you see is their hand. You don't really see the subject. You see, this is Lucian Freud, this is Lucian Freud, this is Lucian Freud. Alice Neal's one of the few who I think can be like, this is Alice Neal, but also here's this other person. Um, but a lot of really formally uh, brilliant artists, when I think of them, I don't think of their subjects at all. I think of what they're doing with paint. And because I feel like the people I work with have been so badly served culturally by images of difference, um, not only do I love the specificities of their body, it's the specificities of what they look like that um, carry everything else. So getting back to your question though, um, it does feel like a self-portrait. I was sort of half joking that I've been building my ghost because between the book and the audio book and the e-book and the ticker tape parade, I don't know what else is coming next. The t-shirts, um, you know, you know what's going on these days. I, and almost everybody out I know is living in daily fear. And so you think a lot about um, what you would leave behind if it did, if you did get the virus. And so, especially the last few months, I'd already written the book. It was already going to print when this happened, but I did the audio book during that, you know, after the outbreak happened. And so there's a way that I feel like exactly the way you say with uh, In the Yellow Woods, that I was building that, I was building myself for when I was gone. Mm -hmm. Well, another thread that runs through the conversations we've had over <clears throat> the decades is the idea of mortality. And, you know, I, I tend to be a, a morbid girl and uh, you aren't always, but you can be. Oh yeah. And so we have a certain number of late night conversations about death. And it does seem as though suddenly the whole world is very deaf aware because we're living through a time when a number of people who really shouldn't be dead right now are. And uh, the, the thing that I wanted to say with this question is how very lively and alive the book is. Good. And I know you're talking about, you know, building your ghost, but the, the thing that I greatly appreciated is recognizing how pure your voice is in these pages. And that, you know, I, I, I could so completely hear your voice, you know, after a million phone conversations, I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Riva, that's her. And, and so I just, uh, you know, from a writer to a writer, I appreciate how beautifully you've put yourself on the page. And also that you've taken a lot of risks. Um, you're a very collaborative artist and you, have written about your collaborations, but also you've, I know, been very careful to um, check a lot of the things in the book with your family and friends, and you know, you've you've taken a lot of care, and uh, you know, it, it it turned into not exactly a collaborative project, but certainly a considerate project, and. Um, Anyway, I, I just wondered if there's, you know, any last things you want to say before we jump into the questions from the audience. Well, it's tricky because um, my aim was not to hurt anyone in the book um, who didn't deserve it. And there were very, very few people who deserved it and most of them were dead. And that helped. Um, but I did, for the most part, send people their chapters um, when I was writing about them and asked them if something was completely beyond the pale that they'd be uncomfortable, horrified, 
Um, and I made a lot of changes, made a lot of changes. Um, and, you know, it was also things like, in talking about relationships, most of the time I owned up to my own malfeasances um, rather than blame people for whatever hurt happened at the time because that what you know I've read plenty of memoirs that did that and I just it icks me out unless there's real reason. So I really hope that people can at least see that I have tried. I'm sure that there are errors I've made, but for anyone who's in the book or anyone who knows people in the book, I have really tried very hard to be fair. I have run it past almost everyone. And um, and I, you know, in the same way that I respect reviewers that won't review books just to say they're bad, I've tried for the most part not to write about people um, in order to complain about them. You know, it's, if you were in the book, it was because you changed my life and eventually for the better. So thank you, everybody who's out there, who's in there. Thank you. Well, speaking of uh, everybody who's out there, let's take some of the questions that people have submitted. Um, so there's a question from Sarah Siegel, and she <laughs> says, uh, thanks for reading a poignant sample of your memoir aloud to us and Mazel Tov on its launch. Uh, what can you do with writing that you can't do as well with painting and drawing and vice versa? Um, they're just different. I mean, I've told Audrey that um, my most blissful days are ones where I divide it between the studio and the computer, that if I get to do both things, I feel immensely whole. You know, you, there's just a lot you can't do in writing that you can do in painting. It's, they're different languages and I hope that they work together in the book, but for me they're, um, it was really great to figure out what I could do with words and I'm hoping to improve going forward. Uh, let's see, there's a question from Darwin Jones who says, uh, can you discuss the vulnerability of doing self-portraits versus the vulnerability of writing memoir or perhaps the empowerment? Well, what I generally happens in my self-portraits, um, and I'd say it's true of the book, and maybe the paintings were training for this. It's a little complicated, but there's this thing I talk about called pain reading which is when someone who's from a stigmatized uh, entity um, appears in an image. And the idea has been that um, that person's basic existence is one of pain. And that I believe has been the idea behind images of disability that everyone who's disabled is suffering terribly and that even if they look happy, they're overcoming or compensating. Um, for the terrible pain they're in. And so it's been important to me for the most part not to bring pain into the portraits I do um, because even the ones I've done that are joyous get yanked there where someone will look at my subject and say, they look so happy, but they have this terrible disease or impairment or and how can they be happy? And I just, you know, want it's <sighs> concealed carry. Anyway, um, but in my self-portraits, that's where I've let the pain happen because there is a shitload of pain in life, in disability, in being different, certainly not just in disability. And so a lot of my self-portraits are where I try and understand the pain of embodiment and literal and, and otherwise. Um, and in the memoir, I guess what was different is I got to go back and forth. I got to have the full range of experience from the completely goofy and silly and funny to the devastating um, and come back and go back. So 
a painting is a single snapshot. It's one image, it's a, a fleeting fragment of a moment. A book lets you keep moving, keep moving. What happens next? What did that mean? How did it unfold? Uh, there's a question from Terry Myers, uh, who says, I know Riva is a voracious reader of fiction. So what about the fictional? Um, what about the fictional? What about <laughs> well, I'm thinking of trying to do it and pray for me. I don't know how. I, <laughs> I'm sure I you will. Read more fiction than nonfiction. And I'm currently almost done with David Mitchell's new novel called Utopia Avenue, which is incredible and making me want to get up in the middle of the night and write. But until the launch month is over, I think it's going to have to wait. But I'm thinking. Um, Jay Verdi um, says, what was the most challenging or difficult aspects of writing your memoir? Trying not to hurt people, trying to be honest. And I know that there are things I said in there that will be painful and I didn't know any way around it. Um, yeah, trying not to hurt people, including my family, especially my family. I, my brother's reading it right now, and I know it's not the easiest thing in the world for him to do. And I don't know if you're out there, Doug, but it's also for me the most meaningful thing that's happening in any and all of this is to have my brother, who you guys will, will read about in the book, um, be with me in this. And um, travel through my part of our life. But, you know, I worry that I've hurt people. I would follow that question with a question of my own, which is, uh, what was the most <laughs> surprising or joyous aspect of writing the book? Oh, words, words, God. Images getting to like, <laughs> I keep joking that Writing is so much easier to clean up after. Like, you know, it's, you don't have stuff spilled all over the floor. Um, but getting to make an image that you can nuance just right um, or what feels right at the time um, and play in that arena, um, that's why I want to go back in. It's not because I'm driven by a particular story, although one's starting to rise up a little bit. Um, I just loved it. And reading other writers ever since I stepped into this arena has been astonishingly amazing. I mean, sometimes it's made me more critical than I would have been otherwise. But I, but more when I'm reading something terrific, the way it's exploding in my brain wasn't happening 10 years ago. I would have just enjoyed it, but now it feels like little fires. So that's been amazing. Uh, there's a question from Lawrence Carter Long, uh, who says, Hi, Reva. Congratulations Hi, on your achievement. Gollum Girl evokes so much, and it struck me that writing a memoir as you've done must be a bit like stepping into a time machine. Where did the journey take you? What surprise visits did you find yourself taking as part of the process? Well, oddly enough, this is what I'm thinking about a lot right now, which is while I was writing it, my sense of where I was in time kept getting unhooked. And I would feel like, why can't I go see this person? Why can't I call them on the phone? Oh, well, they're gone, you know? One way or another, they're gone. And yet they felt so immediate and so totally there in my mind and my emotions that it didn't make sense to me. It really didn't make sense to me that I couldn't just call them or go see them before COVID. And, um, and I kept making me think of this thing I write about in the book, which is the first time I ever went into Cadaver Lab. And well, my time in Cadaver Lab, which left me with this experience of feeling like the line between what was alive and what was dead 
had gotten confused and kind of blurry. So I've been thinking about the fact that the thing that humans cannot accept, cannot endure, the two things we cannot is time and death. And of course, they're functions of each other. At least one is a function of the other. And that what happens when you can't accept it and you don't have the power to do a damn thing about it, but you can't rest in that um, reality if it just mm, eats at you. So yeah, that was going on through a lot of the writing. And that's why I wanna write some more. Speaking of time machines. Um, I think we're about to do something official. Or... Hmm? Oh, no, go ahead. I thought you were gonna, Never mind. I no, gonna uh, no, I'm gonna <laughs> ask a, ask a follow-up question. Yes. Um, so there's a, a concept in physics, the idea of a block universe. And that idea is the notion that all time exists simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and for my own purposes, I tend to imagine it as time as being a large house that you can wander through. And most of us have to take a certain route. We have to go through this room and then that room and then the next room. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that in the process of your writing the memoir that you were involved in all the different time rooms of your house more or less simultaneously. Yeah. And I remember especially at a certain point when you were given a bunch of uh, documents, uh, family photographs and letters and things that I think your brother gave them to you. Yeah, unfortunately they took that chapter out. I'm hoping to submit it somewhere. Yeah, Standalone. but that um, enormous. But even though the chapter isn't in the book, the fact that it has, uh, it's enabled you to, to sort of take some shortcuts to yeah. cut backward into your past. And it struck me that, um, I, I wondered if it affected your memories and how you remember these things. Well, what, what happened is that Doug found a box of um, our parents' papers in a, a storage area in his house um, 10 years after they'd been put there. And they were documents that neither one of us had ever seen, including letters written by my, my parents right out during their honeymoon, um, love letters from them um, to each other, poems my mother wrote, um, medical records, death certificates, all kinds of stuff. And looking at their handwriting, um, I mean, it's like the sense of smell. It's like, if you haven't seen that handwriting in a long time, um, you see the hand all of a sudden. And, you know, like I said, the sense that, why couldn't I go call someone? Why couldn't I go see them? It's exactly what you're talking about, that all the, especially with the physicality of those documents, um, it just threw me for weeks and weeks. I had them all over the house. I was photographing them, I was scanning them. I have them stored over there. Doug, come get them. Um, <laughs> it's a small place here. Um, and some of them were really hard to look at. I don't know what other people do with, this will sound like a segue, it's not. Um, my ongoing theory about why people believe in God is that the loss of one's parents is unbearable and that either knowing that you're going to or being in a society where people experience that as a tremendous blow. I think that um, we came up with a permanent parent, somebody who is always going to be listening, always going to be um, patient and in our ima imagination and then in the end give us back our parents by bringing us up to the cloudy places and I don't know um, still what one does with those memories 
I mean, I'm not walking around weeping or, you know, I mean, I think I've, I've grieved my way through that stuff, but boy, writing this and looking at those documents, <laughs> grief is archeological. You think that you, you know, looked at all the layers and then here's some more layers underneath the layers or sideways to the layers, or there's an avalanche and then all the layers get mixed up. And I think it's more like that. Like there's an avalanche on a hillside and all of the time periods, all of the grieving just goes and it's one big jumble. Uh, there's one more question here, or actually up oh, to. Um, one is uh, from Resin. Hey, Resin. Uh, forgive, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing anybody's name. I'm just bad at it. Um, Resin. Thank you. Um, who says, I'd love to see a portrait of you in the National Portrait Gallery. If you <laughs> had you say, which artist, alive or dead, would create that portrait of you? Of me? Of you. Be one of me? Jeepers. Uh, mm. Mm -hmm. Not to put you on the spot or anything. Well, two pe two painters and one photographer. Um, either Vincent Desiderio or um, um, oh my God, you've completely thrown me, Tim Rowley. <laughs> um, and uh, for photographer Billy Howard. So, and uh, a question from Sandra Lambert who says, I don't think I'm alone as a disabled person in that I remember little of my childhood. First, thank you for sharing your memories for all of us. Second, have you always remembered? Did writing or making art recover memory? Yes. Um, I mean, what's scary is hoping that those memories are real. And I mean, I've talked to some other kids who went to Condon who didn't remember the same things I did. So, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, the memories I have are what was there and I hope they're real. They, I remember them as real, but, um, but when you're writing memoir and you're trying to craft it into a story that is uh, readable and interesting and stands up its own as a narrative, there can be you know, slippages where you have to kind of put some grout in the cracks and, you know, you hope the picture isn't all grout. But there are places where I had to kind of think, I think this is probably what would have happened. I think this is probably what was going on or, you know, this must have been how we got from here to there. But I would have, you know, a piece over here and a piece over there and be like, mm -hmm. so, you know, but yeah, there were a lot of things that came back. And also I talked to a lot of people. Oh my God, I talked to so many people about every, every piece of the book, um, but especially childhood. And the memories people had of me are not the memories I have of myself. So that was, um, I don't know what to do with that. I apparently seem to be a much happier child than I remember being. So why I didn't go into acting, I can never, I never know. Apparently I was better at hiding it than I thought. Uh, I think that is all the questions that people have submitted. I've, I've skipped over one or two of them because um, other conversations seem to have covered the same ground as the question. So thank you everybody for the questions. <laughs> Is it showing oh, well now? <laughs> in case those are golems. Yeah. Also, the golem that is a, US wow. a, a memory stick. So, very appropriate golems memory. So, I collect next time you all go to Prague, bring me something good. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. The golems wave night night. I really. Thank you so much for being here. Well, and thank Sarah, you, Reva. It was a wonderful so thing. Important. And I, I just want to say to everybody that uh, the book is every bit as fantastic as, uh, as you might hope. And uh, I hope you'll get a chance to read it and see it because uh, 
Riva has Riva has written a lovely, lovely thing, and I just I cannot appreciate this enough. So thank you. Lots I, of love I, and congratulations. I haven't been able to see any of the chat, Sarah. Is there any way to see it later? Yeah, I'll thank I'll you. send it to you. Excellent. Uh, you guys, you all have been just fabulous. Like I'm really overwhelmed. <laughs> For Clint. Word of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. We had a wonderful audience, great questions, lots of activity in the chat. If you haven't bought the book, please do. Um, at Women and Children Thirst, we have signed copies. Um, so yep. please support your local feminist bookstore. Thank you both for that incredible conversation. It was so heartfelt and so intimate in this unintimate uh, medium. So I really appreciate it. All right. Have a wonderful Wait. night. Oh. Should I say one last thing? Yeah. I just really want to appreciate Sally and Heidi for making this accessible. I'm trying very hard to make each event that I do as accessible as the hosting venue will, you know will provide and i'm pushing people i am really trying but this is really um i think the best that we're going to get and so thank you both of you so much yes thank you heidi and sally you were incredible all right thank you reva thank you audrey thanks everyone have a wonderful night thank you sarah bye bye bye, -bye. bye.